and a very good afternoon on behalf of everybody associated with the Central Analytical Laboratory and the NADP Program Office. I welcome you to our ongoing series of webinars today entitled NADP Site Maintenance. My name is Jeffrey Pribble. I'm Cal Site Support. Uh, um, my associate is Brian Kirshner running behind the scenes. Uh, thank you once again for taking time out of your day. This is a webinar that we covered on a previous basis, but we got more into the winterization of the gauges and a few things like that. Uh, today, we'll focus a little bit different on actually looking at some of the components uh, and the pieces to both the AeroChem collector as well as the Encon collector, as well as the uh, both types or the three types of gauges that we have: the ETI, NOAA 4, the Opluvio, and the Belfort, and just different things to check why the weather is good. Uh, a lot of our sites are, you know, have a lot of harsh weather and stuff like that can play uh, uh, troubles to the uh, equipment. So we want to look at some different variables that can cause issues that you normally wouldn't see from just taking a uh, view of the top side of the collector. We'll look at uh, some specifics and uh, at the end of this or during the during this at any time, if you have any. I will recite the question that is asked, read it back to everybody, and then try to give you the best of the answers. Uh, this is the first time that you've had an opportunity to join us. Um, the website at the start of this presentation it will bring up now. Go ahead, Brian. And we, during this uh, webinar, we will refer back to slides uh, from time to time. The website goillinois.edu forward slash NADP training will give you a connection to all our previous webinars. You can go back and view those. And if you have any questions at the end of the, uh, on the last slide, it gives a phone number and email address to uh, contact us here if you have any questions, problems, or concerns. Thank you once again for joining us today. Our first slide up there is a very beautiful picture of a mountainous scene there. Obviously, when you're talking site maintenance, the site maintenance that you would have to do for the picture on the right might vary a little bit for the picture on the left. Uh, the picture on the left is from one of our Colorado sites. You see it up on a platform. That's because of the intense snow, the amount of snow they get throughout the year. The picture on the right is from our home site, Illinois 11 at Bonville. Uh, that's a testing site. Uh, it's actually part of the network, but a lot of other different uh, uh, networks are out there, uh, not necessarily related to NADP. We do some testing of gauges anytime we get equipment, stuff like that. So uh, that's our Illinois Bonville site. Next slide, please. One of the things that we talk about, when you start a, a site, an NADP site, there's obviously rules and regulations that have to be met and matched before uh, the approval will be given to put in a uh, ring collection site, and I want to go over those really quick. Uh, highlighted in red, and all this is uh, available to be downloaded uh, from your desktop at the end of this webinar, and I want to go over the rules, uh, the rules and the guidelines, and uh, just to clarify a little bit. And as I said, if, if throughout any of this, if you have any questions, please go ahead and stop me, and I'll try to answer them at the best. My ability, if I can't get the answer during the webinar, then I will refer back and contact you on a one-on-one -on -one basis and uh, be able to answer your question. One of the first rules in looking is making sure the vegetation is less than 0.6 meters. You don't want the vegetation growing so high. We'll cover that more. Uh, guidelines are, you know, the ground slope. You want the collectors and the gauges to be on a type of a level ground. You don't want your, you know, your equipment to be lower than, you know, the other piece of equipment and the ground cover, cover typical of the area. Obviously, what you saw for the ground cover at our Illinois 11 site would not necessarily, necessarily pertain to, say, the mountainous regions of some of our other sites. Greater than five meters from the collector, objects greater than one meter tall and greater than five centimeters in width. Uh, one thing that you notice, or you may notice in pictures if you look at different sites, is some sites are built on platforms. One of the recommendations is treated wood and using treated wood because of the splash concept that you may get from rain. 
Uh, if you're using treated wood and a greater than five meters from the top of the collector, uh, you're going to have to have a pretty hard rain to get that amount of bounce. So if that's uh, very rarely anymore, uh, do you go into a Lowe's, a Menards, or a Home Depot and get wood that hasn't been treated with some sort of uh, chemical? Uh, so if you do have treated wood, you know, try to uh, let us know what it's all about. Uh, greater than 10 meters from the collector, access roads, uh, less than 10 vehicles a day. A lot of our sites are in remote areas. You know, you have to take the gravel roads back to our particular site at Illinois 11. Uh, try to minimize your speeds. Obviously, you don't want to kick up any dirt or, uh, you know, if you have winds and stuff like that across the prairie, uh, any gravel or dust that gets kicked up can travel. Greater than 20 meters from the collectors, uh, being in here in central Illinois, uh, the particular site I talked about, Illinois 11, is surrounded by cornfields and soybeans. Uh, you know, pre, pre-emergent herbicides and stuff like that, uh, you don't want to have herbicide use, fertilizer use, pastures, or cultivated fields that have to be within a certain distance if you have uh, that particular thing. One thing to, you know, kind of stress is what may start out as a perfect site, you know, following all the criteria, um, things happen throughout, you know, science projects are added, roads are added, stuff like that. There have been occasions to where we've had to uh, move sites because of a um, unfortunate situation where, you know, a building's added, a road's added, or something like that. So always make sure that if, you know, you're incurring something like that possibly happening at your site, you let us know. Uh, we talk about it. We'll send it through the QA office and uh, make sure that it's not going to uh, compromise any of the uh, uh, siting criteria for your particular site. Greater than 30 meters, parking lots, maintenance areas, uh, less than six vehicles a day. Um, you know, more remote than anything. You don't want to have it. Uh, so close. I, we bring our vehicles up to a certain point near the collector to minimize trying to have to carry things, but keep them from a far enough distance that it will not uh, affect anything. Greater than 100 meters from the collector uh, rules are unpaved roads and greater than 10 vehicles, less than 50 kilometers, having the paved roads, uh, you know, greater than 100 vehicles a day, waterways, harbors, marinas, airports, uh, like I said, the siting criteria varies according to, we have 260 some sites across the network. So we do have sites, you know, a little bit of everywhere from the Virgin Islands clear up to uh, northern parts of Alaska, northern parts of Maine. So the terrain is going to vary uh, with each in particular, with each individual site. Greater than 500 meters, uh, highways, large stationary combustion sources, large animal operations, uh, greater than one kilometer interstates. Uh, rules for around the collector, guidelines for around the collector, uh, electrical utilities, chemical manufacturing, mining operations, medical fabrication, incinerators, uh, other industrial operations that can kick up a lot of contaminants through the airwaves. Uh, question? Yeah. For the uh, rules right in the middle, uh, horizontal distance uh, for the collector, the gauge should be at least greater than five meters away from the collector and no more than 30 meters away from the collector. And the vertical distance should be no more than a foot above or below the actual setting of the rain gate or the bucket collector itself. So, I mean, when you put stuff on platforms or if you're putting them on uh, – like cemented pads, just make sure that it's within the siting criteria of no more than those particular rules. Those are the rules that we really want to stress more than anything. Any questions thus far? I'll stop right there. And like I said, if you have any questions throughout that I may not have been able to answer in the onset, uh, don't hesitate to call or email. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Our two collectors, one on the left is an AeroChem collector. It's a two-bucket collector. We currently have about 170 of those. Still in the network, we're making a slow transition to the one-bucket collector 
called the end time collector. Basically, the collector to the left is triggered with a grid sensor, where the one on the right, the end time, is triggered with a optical sensor. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. Uh, so if you have an AeroChem, you're going to have to listen to me talk about the end cons. If you got end cons, you're going to have to listen to me talk a little bit about the AeroChems, but we hope to uh, cover the basis for both. Next slide, please. Site vegetation, I'm not going to get a lot into this just yet. I want to more cover it at the end, but we talked about the vegetation not being more than, you know, a couple of feet high around the collector. Uh, you notice with this particular one, uh, AC power and the power sources for different sites vary. This one's an AC site. Uh, so you want to be careful in doing your uh, vegetation maintenance and stuff like that to not cut cords and stuff like that. I want to touch base on that a little bit more at the end of this one. That is the AeroChem collector, the two bucket collector. You'll see the sensor faces to the north, the wet bucket to the west, the, east, the dry bucket to the east. That should be the setup for the collector when installed at your site. Next slide, please. Issues with the motor box. This is a motor box in case nobody has ever changed one. I don't have one that I'm going to put on camera. But familiarize yourself with the particular motor box. This is the face. Uh, the power sources for the motor box are run either by AC, DC batteries, or by solar. Um, when troubleshooting these kind of things, and I talk about familiarizing yourself with the particular components of a collector because when you call in, if something's not working, I'm going to go through a set of questions or Brian or whoever you may speak to on the phone is going to go through a set of questions as to did you check your fuses, uh, you know, are the wires connected? Uh, and as I do this site support a little bit more, I'm familiarizing myself with different things that can go on with these particular types of collectors. So it's good to once in a while when you have, you know, animals and stuff like that, you have harsh winters, weather conditions, Things can come loose. Things can corrode. Uh, so what you want to do is familiarize yourself. Check your connections. When working with this particular component underneath the collector, uh, if you're on an AC source or even in a good practical state, uh, disconnect the power. Uh, we, we preach safety first. We don't want anybody to have any accidents. And I've been the uh, recipient of a couple little shocks from this motor box because I did not use uh, good safety. So uh, we ask that you unplug the uh, the component itself. If you recognize the fuse, one of the things when you call, if an operator calls and says, well, I, I can't seem to get my collector to move, one of the things that I'm going to ask you is, did you check the AC fuse? That's a little black knob. If you can see the arrow, uh, basically you push in and turn counterclockwise, pull it out, and not visually inspect the fuse per se, but take a voltmeter, uh, put it on a continuity. There is, an, there is a link at the end of this webinar uh, that will show you all about using a, a multimeter. If you do not have one, let us know. We'll try to send you one. Uh, it's, it's an operator's best friend. If you're out the site, uh, you know, those operators that maybe only have 100 yards out their back door uh, in comparison with some operators that travel 90 miles one way. So always keep that handy if you can. Uh, check your event recorder terminal strip uh, for your wire connections. It lets you indicate whether it be through a Belfort gauge, uh, the top pin line on the Belfort gauge indicating the openings and closings, or if you're using an electronic gauge, the number of cycles that you see all be indicated by your wiring at your event recorder terminal. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, please. The sensor socket, that's something that's held together by a cannon plug. I'm going to show a little bit more specifics on that momentarily, but that is your AeroChem motor box. Are there any questions? Sensor cleaning. This is a good photo I put in. The sensor uh, is a seven grid sensor. We ask that you, you know, just keep an eye on it, clean it every so often. If you notice to the left, there's a brush, and on that brush, there's a kind of a gold shiny side, and on the other side, it's a black bristly side. 
Never use the gold shiny side. Uh, the sensor plate is real susceptible to scratching. Uh, that's why I wanted to show it. So if you're going to clean your sensor, and you can see on this sensor, uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, it has a little bird dew on it. Uh, you know, birds like to uh, perch on there and do their business. And when they activate the collector, it burns their little feet. They fly off, and when it cools down, it comes back. So a lot of times you'll see uh, a lot of cycles in the top line, but you may not have any precip. Uh, birds are the culprit a lot of times. When you're cleaning your sensor, uh, ask that you do it at when you've collected your sample bucket and have your sample capped. And before you put on your next bucket, make sure that you clean it real good. Uh, you can flush it as much as you want. Use deionized water and... Uh, that's basically the only thing you really have to do. Off to the left of the bottom uh, picture, you'll see the little blue uh, plug system. That's a female connection to the sensor that goes into the motor box. Always make sure that if you do disconnect that from the male part of the motor box, uh, look for any sort of cobwebs and stuff like that. Bugs can get a little bit everywhere. Uh, take like a little wire brush or whatever and clean those ports out. Uh, making sure you have a good net connection uh, so you don't uh, have any problems with, uh, you know, losing the collector from opening and closing. Next slide, please. Are there any questions real quick? This is the underneath side of the AeroChem. And as I, as I said, as I do the job of being site support, I'm learning an awful lot about what can go wrong. I wish it was as cut and dry as the, you know, my motor box is not working, my sensor is not working. But over the time, this collector is now referred to as a dinosaur. I mean, it's an old component. Uh, it's a basic system of, uh, you know, wetting the sensor, the collector opening. But I want to go to a couple of different things to point out to operators to check. When you're looking at this particular slide, you're going to see that you have what's called a push rod. That when you have the motor box attached, the push rod will go into the side of the motor box with one screw. You got to make sure, and the directions will come if you ever have to change a motor box. But if you notice the four red circles around the clutch springs and the counterweight, there's a couple U brackets. And I'm going to go to a live shot, so bear with us a moment because I really want everybody to see this who has an AeroChem to check, and we will refer back to this. Can everybody see this really well? I'm going to try to put this as close to the to the camera as possible. But see where my fingers are pointing on this? Okay, how's that? See where my fingers are pointing here? These are two little U-clips, and the way this is designed to work is the this push rod should be against one of the U-clips exactly seven and three-eighths inches away from the end of this push rod as well as seven and three-eighths. So the problem with this particular push rod is this U-bracket came away from the push rod. And what happens is when the collector is trying to cycle itself, with this not being up against this, this has the ability to slide back and forth. So basically, if you're connected to the motor box and the collector tries to cycle, see what can happen with this push rod is it can slide back and forth. So when this is up against, both of the U brackets are up against each other, there's no ability for this to slide up and down this particular metal shaft. So what I ask you to check, uh, and it also works for the counterweight as well, if you want to refer back to the, to the uh, previous slide, Brian, if you could, please. Bear with me just a moment. Okay, on the counterweight, you see the big counterweight? That has a pair of the U-clips as well. If that counterweight has an opportunity to slide one direction or other, then it causes the lid to hang up. So that also has to have those U-clips tight on both sides of that counterweight as well as on both sides of the push rod. Those two springs that you see, and if you'll come back to me, I'm going to show you this again. See the two springs here? 
These springs have to be very, very tight. What happens is if you have loose springs on your push rod, it doesn't put any resistance against the clutch on the motor box. So the looser it is, then the inability for the clutch and the spring on the motor box to grab the lid and move it from side to side can be uh, compromised. So one of the checks that we want you to do for site maintenance when weather permits is to make sure that these springs are nice and tight. What can happen over the time too is this little push rod, and you can still see on the camera, can become a little bit bent. So as this is, has the ability to slide up and down a little bit and the collector you know, will hang up on occasion, what happens is this can get a little bit bent, which kind of sets the collector off of its sequence of being able to make a nice smooth transition from the wet side to the dry side and from the dry side back to the wet side. If for some reason, when you go out to check this, if these U-clips are missing on either the counterweight or on the push rod here, uh, let us know. We can replace the whole component and say, oh my goodness, I don't want to have to replace that. Well, if you get right down to it, it's one screw that goes into the clutch in the motor box and you have a screw on each end of the silver push rod and that's all it is to replace it. So it's not a big deal. I can do it. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. Are there any questions real quick? Because we have covered a lot as far as this particular type of maintenance. If you want to say, maybe lube this a little bit, and that's a good thing to do. Do not, and I'll repeat in quotes, do not use WD-40. Why not? Uh, we recommend that you use gum out. It's a non-residue type of spray. Uh, what happens with WD-40 is it has the ability, although it lubricates, it can dr uh, um, draw dirt, grease, grime, film, and stuff like that. And over a time period, then it can get all gummed up so with gum out, you don't get any residual effects. So that's why we highly recommend the gum out. Are there any questions? I'm going to kind of jump back real quick. When I was talking about cleaning the sensor, if you look at your sensor and you say, oh, well, it looks clean, over a period of time, over four or five months, as you get the sun, you get the dust, you get the wind, the rain, uh, the snow or whatever, you can get a non-visual type of uh, residue film on top of the sensor grid that can cut down sometimes on the sensitivity of the sensor grid. So occasionally with your uh, toothbrush side of your uh, brush there, clean it real good. Just, you know, it may not look dirty, but you might be surprised at the amount of sense, how the sensitivity of the sensor improves. Are there any questions? Covered a lot of material. If I didn't answer your questions, uh, if everything looks good and you just need the U-clips, we can send those uh, all by themselves. You do not have to replace this whole uh, carriage component. Uh, but like I said, if you have any of this, uh, let me know. We'll talk on the phone or email me and get back with you as soon as I can. Next slide, please. Adjusting the collector lid on the Incon. When we install the Incons, uh, have a couple different ways of adjusting. This is something that I, if this needs done, I'd rather talk to you on the phone. This was just a slide. But what we want to do is to, this is kind of an email attachment that you'll have as well, but you need to put as much pressure on the bucket lid when you loosen the hex screws or the Allen screws uh, to add tension to when the bucket closes and when it comes off of it and rests on its uh, plate, resting plate, and that comes back over the top of the bucket, we ask that, you know, that the seal be as tight as possible on the end con. They're preset. Uh, using different buckets, we've added the spacers uh, to the end con collectors where you can boost the bucket up a little bit if you've got a gap. Uh, it's supposed to be a specific kind of a bucket that we use, but we're, you know, we have an, a, uh, a retrofit for using a different kind of bucket to boost that up. So if there's any questions, uh, had a side operator said his was just a little bit off after replacing the new Incon lid seal that we're in the, in the process of sending out. This particular seal is just a hair thicker. So the way it sits on the bucket is a little bit more snug, may take an adjustment, 
may not, but uh, if that's something that you feel that needs to be done, uh, then don't hesitate to call me. Next slide, please. The thief sensor. This is a sensor, the optical sensor that goes along, and I can show this to you or I can just kind of point it out either way. Uh, it, yeah, bring it to me real quick. This is a thief sensor that's set up for the Encon buckets. It's basically got the plug underneath it on the diagram. Here's the, the cannon plug that goes with the thief sensor. This is how it's mounted. This is a three-prong plug that goes male and female that uh, gets plugged into the side of the collector. What I really want to point out to everybody is the U-shape in the thief sensor. This is something that the spiders and stuff like that love to build cobwebs in, can cut down on the sensitivity. So on a weekly basis, maybe take a Q-tip or, or, you know, like a chem wipe or a paper towel or something along those lines, kind of run it through there as you're changing your bucket to keep that clean. One other thing that we're starting to, or we've noticed from time to time and had to replace these particular types of sensors is the uh, top plate. Uh, the harsh winter conditions and stuff like that is causing these to crack a little bit. It's basically a hard plastic, and what happens when these crack just a little bit is it allows moisture to get into the into the brains of the uh, the sensor and causes them to short out a little bit. So if you're noticing any sort of cracks or uh, informities on your top plate of your sensor grid, uh, we need to talk about replacing it, and we do have replacement sensors that we can send you. So, uh, you know, take a good look at that. You want to keep the inside. It may not be just spider webs, but uh, on a weekly basis, uh, there's where your optical sensors are at. So clean those. Just kind of take a towel. You don't want to never take your finger like that. But I'm just showing that as a way of going about making sure that that little U shape is nice and clear. Are there any questions? That pretty much covers the sensor part of it. Take time to digest this real quick, and if you have any questions, type them down. I'll share them with the the group. On to the gauges. This is the Opluvio gauge. There's not a lot of maintenance you can do to it. Uh, what this gauge is, it's called the Fat Boy, and no reference to the guy talking to you right now. Uh, has the RMM, which is the brains of the collector or the gauge. Sometimes it's mounted underneath. Sometimes it's mounted in its own little pole on the side that you can see the left. Uh, when you're downloading your data on every Tuesday, you have to open that up, attach it to your flash drive, and just make sure that the you know the wires are all connected, that you got the flashing light up on the data logger, uh, the red flashing light. Uh, you can do a little battery maintenance. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, make sure there's no spiders, cobwebs, or rodents that have got in there and chewed wires. Uh, during the winter months, when you do winterize this thing, or even during the summer months, if you get a lot of precipitation, uh, try to empty it on a routine basis, and we'll talk about how to do that momentarily. That is the Opluvio 2 gauge. Any questions? Next gauge is the NOAA 4, works the same concept. Uh, basically, it's not as easy to take this one apart. You've got to pull the top of the, uh, the top cap off, loosen the Allen screws, unplug the load cell, and pull the shell right up, straight off, exposing uh, the guts of the bucket or the guts of the gauge, as well as a collection bucket that you see sitting on top of the platform there. Real important as we go to the next slide, one of the things, the only real maintenance you can do to this is making sure that if for some reason that you uh, go out there and you try to connect with your PDA and your PDA gives you a, a message that says COM port not enable, that's indicative of maybe a power loss. The battery on this particular system is designed to cover for about three days. So if you have a longer power outage, then chances are you're going to have to probably reset this gauge uh, it's a simple case of unplugging a wire, seeing if you got a blue flashing light, checking your connections, and putting the whole gauge back together. Kind of cumbersome in the winter months, but uh wish there was an easier way to do it. That's the way it was designed. This is hard to reset. One of the screws, I don't know. 
Is it hard to re the question is, is it hard to rethread one of the screws on a NOAA? Uh, I guess I would have to ask you to be a little bit more specific as far as rethreading the screws. There's four screws at the bottom. Uh, they're Allen screws that when the shell goes back down on top, uh, that it tightens down to alleviate the wind shake that you may getting that you may get from the rattling of the gauge if it's not tight or the shell if it's not tight. We'll come back to that question here momentarily as I'll give her an opportunity to empty in the collection chamber. As I talked about, you want to you don't want these things to get full to the top, but if uh, if they do then this transfer pump we supply these uh kind of easy just uh the hose goes in one end you pump it out into a discard bucket in the other end be very careful if you're using uh antifreeze try to use the isopropyl or not the isopropyl the polypropylene glycol it's a little bit more uh, environmental friendly uh, find a place to uh, discard that you always want to keep your antifreeze I'm talking to you in the summer months. Uh, there are some sites that are still winterized, and they are winterized year-round. What you want to do is you want to keep your antifreeze as fresh as possible so that the antifreeze and the water that's in from the precipitation don't stratify because the antifreeze is a little bit heavier. It'll sink to the bottom if you don't stir it on a consistent basis. That's what will happen. So any precip will land on the frozen ice that's on top and not get an accurate uh amount of precipitation. Any questions on the transfer pumps? Like I said, if you do not have one of these, uh, let us know. We'll send you one. Yeah, any more about the routine maintenance on the pump? The routine, ma the question is, you need to elaborate on the on the routine maintenance on the OT, please. Um, the routine maintenance is the battery checks, which I'll get to momentarily, uh, making sure that the antifreeze is uh, fresh, uh, doing the maintenance on the, just making sure when you open it up that the flash drive is tucked away, uh, no moisture on that. As far as routine maintenance, there's not a lot of routine maintenance that you can do with the Pluvio that I'm aware of, uh, other than just keeping the rodents out of there and keeping the cobweb clear of the, uh, of the electrical connections. Do you need the transfer pumps with the uh, do, the question is, do you need the transfer pump for the yacht, yeah, if you don't want to have to lift that big container of water, uh, basically you can, uh, without taking the gauge apart, basically put the one end of the transfer pump into the into the uh, chamber, the collection chamber on both the NOAA 4 and the Yacht Pluvio, and pump the uh, uh, antifreeze or water, whatever you may have, into the bucket that's on the right to the discard bucket, and uh, you wouldn't have to take it apart. So that's a uh, that's the way to go about that. If you want to take it apart and dump it, then, you know, more power to you, but we're, we're going to try to make it easy with this transfer pump. So if you don't have one, then holler at us, we'll get you one. Uh, the question is, should I empty the yacht each week? No, not necessary. Uh, it's a big chamber. It'll hold up to, I believe, 30 gallons. Uh, so it's not necessary that it be, uh, uh, emptied each week. Your precipitation for the week is measured upon what your last precipitation reading is when you send your data in. So if you send in, if you have three or four inches in there uh, and you get, say, 58 hundredths of an inch the following week, your particular precipitation will be based upon what your last reading was when you download the, the previous week to when you download that following week. Question is, the environmental friendly antifreeze got slushy in a bucket that was in a cover shelter for another project I had. Will thick slushy damage the pluvio? No, it won't damage it, but what we want to use is fresh antifreeze. Uh, slushy antifreeze is antifreeze that is frozen. It's probably lost its, uh, its ability to melt the precipitation the way we want it to. Uh, if it has the ability to get slushy, when antifreeze is fresh, uh, it should melt anything and there should never be any slushy or ice in it. Once it gets to the point where it's become either partially frozen, stratified, or slushy, that's time to repeat it or replace it. 
To get back to one question is the operator said that the coworker took a took a screw out and tried to put it back and it went in crooked so it won't go back in. I'd have to I'd have to see which particular screw. If you'd like to send me a photo, this particular operator has my uh email address, so please send me a picture if you can and I'll try to help you as bestly as best as I can. Any more questions? Move on to the next slide if we could. Putting the bucket or the collector back together, this is real important for both gauges, but this is uh, something that definitely needs to be done because this can cause bad data, more so in the NOAA 4 than it will the Ot Pluvio. If you look at the uh, photo to the left, it's just, uh, it doesn't have the wire. That's the wire. The wires that you see are coming from the, the inside shell for the optical sensor and when those lay across the load cell and you set the bucket on there that causes the bucket to wobble it won't sit properly and instead of 2a you get 2b so that's why you need to make sure that the wires are underneath the load cell in the NOAA 4. Next slide please. And if you look down on it 3a is the correct for when the wires aren't there and 3b is the incorrect uh, 4A is, if you see, you're looking at, you can see the two low optical sensors in the opening of the uh, shell of the, or the uh, collection bucket, and 4B being incorrect. You can see, the, what I tell everybody is you should have the same amount of circumference uh, on the inside bucket all the way around the outside shell. So if it's uh, wobbly like 4B is kind of sitting in there at an angle, and you can see on the left-hand side of 4B that you've got quite a little space between the collection bucket and the shell, where on the right side of that you don't have any clearance, so obviously it's not on there correct. If it's not sitting, there's there's uh, nodules on the underneath side of the NOAA 4 as well as the Op Pluvio uh, collection bucket. If you're not sitting on the load cell properly, that thing will wobble. That's your first dead giveaway. Any questions? Next slide, please. Battery testing, load testing. Uh, the picture on the bottom has me with our load tester. Uh, probably better so than sending you this load tester uh, would be to take a battery. If you're using batteries, take them to an AutoZone, a O'Reilly Auto Parts, Advanced Auto Parts, and take the battery and, ask, and just simply ask them, load test it. Uh, we recommend if you're going to use batteries, whether you're using solar, uh, DC power, or using a battery backup to your AC power, that you have these load tested on a semi-annual basis. Uh, in the harsher conditions, maybe a little bit more frequently, but it's tough to carry these things, uh, you know, up and down the mountains and stuff like that in a backpack. So, you know, as often as you can. The bucket or the battery to the left is a deep cycle marine RV battery. What most of the sites are that have the battery power is they'll have a couple of these that'll be set up in parallel. Uh, at least 700 cold cranking amps will get you, you're gonna need more than one battery to run a site. If you're running an AeroChem site, one or two batteries may get it done for you, uh, depending upon your weather conditions. For running an Incon, one or two batteries won't even begin to touch it because there's a little bit of a draw uh, by the Incon or by the thief sensor on the Incon collector. So these batteries, uh, unless you have a battery bank of about three or four of them, uh, probably aren't going to last you more than a week. And you're going to constantly be swapping out batteries. The little battery, the maintenance free battery, is the ones that we use for the Opluvio gauge as well as the NOAA 4 gauge. We supply these if you cannot purchase your own. The test that I ask for these is to, you should have a good reading, a good proper reading is about 12 and a half, 12 to 13 and a half. Uh, that's using your multimeter, which there is, as I said, there is a attachment uh, on the end of this webinar that will show you all about using a, a uh, multimeter, but what we want you to do with those is disconnect the wires uh, from your gauge uh, momentarily to get a true reading. When the wires are connected, you're going to get a reading coming from the gauge itself, uh, which can kind of be a, 
misprognosis. Uh, when the battery's all by itself and you put the uh, multimeter to it, it's going to give us a true reading as to what the battery and battery alone reading is. And like I said, we want it anywhere from about 11.5 to 13.5. If you cannot purchase your own, uh, then we'll work with you to get you one and go from there. Next slide, please. Question. Battery. The battery in the NOAA, does it have to be checked out too? Uh, you don't have to take that. To, the question is, the battery in the NOAA, does it have to be checked out? Uh, you don't have to take that into an auto parts store. Basically, uh, disconnect the wires uh, that you have coming out of your uh, trickle charger. Uh, put a multimeter to it. Uh, polarity does matter, positive and negative, and check to see if you have at least 11.5 to 13.5 volts uh, DC. Next slide, please. The old Belfort. Wow. That thing's older than I am. But I want you to familiarize yourself because there are still operators that do have the Belfort rain gauge. They're trying to uh, go to the electronic gauges, but for those operators that still have these, they still work. They still work really well, but you have to uh, treat them with kid gloves. They have a mind of their own. And uh, routine maintenance uh, biannually is uh, uh, biannually uh, to spray cobwebs. Mice love this gauge. I mean, this this baby is home to a lot of the Mises uh, in the United States. Um, the way this works is basically take the outer shell of the gauge off. You can spray every component in that gauge except for the pin nibs with gum out. And then I take a little brush like you would use for maybe uh, model airplanes or model cars and just kind of brush it. Spray everything and get the grease, grime, dirt, and everything like that out of the nooks and crannies that you'll see on this gauge. Uh, near the back of it, if you were to push down on that bucket, you're going to see that the bottom preset pin, which reads the amount of precipitation, is going to bounce up and down. That's okay. That's, that's exercising the gauge. Make sure that when you do this, you don't have a chart on there that you would mess up the, uh, you know, the charts that you have on for the week. Bounce it up and down, uh, free it, uh, and a lot of times it'll work better. If for some reason your pin nibs are uh, not inking properly, take your thumb and your forefinger, those pin nibs will slide off. Slide them off gently, try not to get as much purple ink on your fingers as you can, and clean them with either a little toothbrush, that little brush that you use to clean your gauge with, and some isopropyl alcohol, slide them back on and refill them with the ink. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. If it doesn't, let me know. I'll try to scratch up a replacement for you. We'll go from there. The old clock. Uh, winding clocks. Uh, there again, um, when you take the drum off of when you got the ring gauge chart, you want to make sure that the underneath gear on the bottom of the drum meshes up with the gear and shaft for the NTN, uh, which pictured in the left. Never overwind these things. Uh, when you start to feel a little tension, stop. You overwind them, they're done. You might as well take them off and send them in. I'll replace them. Uh, but when you start to feel a little tension, uh, for the batteries, biannually, uh, whether it's running good or not, uh, just make sure that you pop the old uh, D-cell battery out and replace it. There are a few that have the C-cell battery. But one thing to make sure of is you see the connection, the wire connection that goes from the battery into the battery pack. Uh, make sure that that does not obstruct the ability for the drum to turn. Sometimes the wires get a little bit too close to those pins. They hang up, get caught up, and uh, makes a real mess of things. Next slide. Site vegetation. To the left is unacceptable. To the right is even more unacceptable. Uh, to the left, you never want the grass to get higher than a than six meters or 0.6 meters uh, in height. Uh, you want to keep it down. Uh, when trimming around your site, make sure that, you know, watch wires, connections, uh, you know, your event recorder wires that may come from your gauge. Uh, they should be underground and conduit. Not everybody's got it. Uh, so be real careful that you don't sl slice a wire, uh, especially in de dealing with AC. Uh, I don't know how you all would look with curly hair. I look terrible with it. The photo to the right is an example of cutting things too short. Uh, you want to at least leave about a foot around the collector and the gauge. The problem with what's to the right is if you're going to have a good Illinois flatlands, prairie, 30-mile-an-hour sustained wind, it's going to kick that up 
And if you have a rainstorm and it kicks that up at 30 miles an hour, some of that could end up in our collection bucket or in our gauge. Uh, and that's what we want to try to avoid. So try to, when you cut your grass around the collector or your gauge, to try to keep it, you know, no more than uh, maybe about six inches in height. Any questions? One comment was made that they did not think that the gauge was newer than Pribble. So, blaming me for my age, I know. Just turned 51, not getting older, getting better. Questions or comments? Thank you, everybody. Uh, if there's ever any uh, questions or comments, 1-800-952-7353, fax at 217-333-0249, or email ntn at isws.illinois.edu. Uh, like I said, I may not have been able to answer all the questions today, uh, but take those numbers, those email addresses, and uh, call me, uh, and we'll do our best to uh, get you the answers that we need uh, and uh, go from there. Any final questions? Okay, there's a uh, Brian, my... Uh, studio engineer just uh, put up the link for downloading the use of the vault multimeter. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can download that. Be real careful. You know, I, I talked a little bit about looking at motor boxes, looking at sensors and stuff like that. You know, all that, that's all said and good and everything like that. But what you got to be real careful of is safety first. Uh, you know, whether it be a battery, whether it be an AC line, whether it be solar panels, Make sure you know what your power is doing before you go tackling any of the things that I uh, recommended under site maintenance. Uh, you could be in for a big surprise uh, and th things like that happen, and they, uh, we don't want them to happen because we preach safety first. No more questions. On behalf of David Gay, the program director, and Chris Lehman, the central analytical lab director, and for my protege, Brian Kirshner, this is Jeff Pribble saying thank you very much for taking time out of your day. And thank you for your continued support in making NADP what it is.